Well, Eddie, here we are, back in Diamond City after another wasted trip. But the plus side is, I collected enough scav between College Square and Park Street to make a good bit of caps. And now I've got a little spreading around money, which has made me some new friends here in Diamond City, and got me a new lead. But let's start where we last left off. After our disappointing trip to College Square, and our run-in with as Solomon calls them, the Tin Can Brigade, we trekked back to Diamond City, sold off some scav and resupplied for the trip, and after a night of heavy drinking, headed off to Park Street. I wasn't sure what to expect, this being my first trip deep into the ruins of Boston proper. The major city ruins in California and the Mojave had been civilized, but I knew there wasn't that level of community here to do that and my experience with the DC ruins taught me that cities were usually infested with ghouls and super mutants. Boston turned out a bit different. I did run into a few stray ghouls on my way down Boylston Street, but while I did see some super mutants off in the distance a few times, it seems like a territory war between mutants and raiders keeps the population of both sides down. I walked past several Boston landmarks I knew I'd have to return to later, but I wanted to press on. I knew I was getting close when the Boston Commons came into view. I had been warned about this place. I had been told to beware the swan, whatever that meant. I stuck to the streets outside the Commons for now, and lo and behold, I soon found a working pre-war Protectron tour guide. You always like it when we find other robots for you to be friends with, don't you, Eddie? Just teasing, Eddie. I know you're a whole lot more advanced than some walking travel brochure. Still, he was a good source of information, so I got what I could out of him. Welcome, Patriot, to Boston Common, the start of the Freedom Trail. Feast your ears and learn more about the historic Freedom Trail. And learn the history of Boston Common. Starting here at Boston Common, follow the red path as it winds its way through our great city's streets. Markers on the trail are placed at many famous historic sites. See Paul Revere's house, the old North Church, the old State House, Bunker Hill, and many more. Hmm, I heard something about the Freedom Trail in Diamond City. Something to do with the railroad? Error. Response not recognized. Well, maybe I will walk the Freedom Trail at some point. But today, I'm more interested in what you can tell me about this area. Let us go back hundreds of years. It is the year 1775 or seven years Thousands of British soldiers have camped on this very soil in their orderly rows of tents led by General Thomas Gage. They seek to quell the growing tide of revolution the night of April 17. The officers are assembled, General Gage. Four days prior, I received word from the Earl of Dartmouth. We have our orders. Lieutenant Colonel Smith, gather 21 companies of our best men and carry them with the utmost expedition and secrecy to Concord. Once there, you will seize and destroy all artillery, ammunition, provisions, tents, small arms, and all military stores. But what of the columns, General? Take care that the soldiers do not plunder the inhabitants or hurt private property. But we can and must defang them. So, near midnight, Colonel Smith marched with 700 Redcoats to face brave American patriots in the Battle of Lexington and Concord. And thus, the Revolutionary War began. Continue on the trail 
to walk through more of our great city's history. So this is where the British started from. The orders that led to the Battle of Lexington and Concord that we learned about back in Sanctuary. The shot heard round the world. But that was all I could get out of the bot, so it was going to be up to some digging for relics to learn more. And Park Street Station, which was my destination anyways, seemed like a fine place to look. As seems to usually be the case with old subway stations, it was filled with ghouls, but also with lots of valuable scav, and, to this intrepid relic hunter, windows into the past as well. A few holotapes soon began to tell a story. The Boston Common was the site of the first European settlement in Boston by a man named William Blackston in 1625. Europe? I don't know, Eddie. I think it's an island east of here. I think England is on it or something. Anyways, he had a house on Beacon Hill, and the common was his farmland. In 1629, new settlers arrived in the area, called the Puritans. No, I don't know what that means either, Eddie, but it sounds religious and boring. Blackston invited them to settle on his land in Boston, as they had trouble finding clean water where they had originally settled in Charlestown. <laughs> Some things never change, huh, Eddie? Everybody's always looking for clean water around here. They granted Blackston the common, which seems odd since it was already his, and then he sold it back to them and left a few years later. The Puritans then began to use it as a pasture for grazing cows open to all residents, hence the name Common. Cows, oh, I actually know that one, Eddie. That's what Brahmin mutated from. <clears throat> Apparently, they only had one head. Weird, right? Apparently, though, after a few years, the land became overgrazed because too many richer families bought too many cows. And in 1646, grazing was limited to 70 cows at a time. Areas soon became a multi-purpose public park. Cows remained until the early 1800s, but it was used for many other things. Public executions were held here. Well, if Maxon's jolly fascists take over, I wouldn't be surprised that they are again. I wouldn't want to hang around. That's a bit of gallows humor, Eddie. It was also a meeting place where large crowds could gather. A riot broke out here in 1713 over a food shortage in which the lieutenant governor was shot. As our friend the Tourbot out there said, it was used as a camp by the British during what I'm becoming increasingly convinced was only called the Revolutionary and not Evolutionary War. In the early 1800s, the small street running up the hill to the State House was renamed from Sentry Street to Park Place and later Park Street, and with the banning of cows in 1830, it emerged as a true public park with perimeter malls and recreational promenades. Originally, the lowest lying parts of the commons and the public gardens were used as a dumping ground for local sewage. Yes, Eddie, poop. It was described as a moist stew that reeked and was a mess to walk over. As you can imagine, not too many people visited that part of the park. There had been plans for a long time to fix that part of the park with new soil, but the cost was too high. Until, that is, in 1895, the Tremont Street subway began to be excavated, and the resulting soil was used. Which brings us to the Park Street station itself. Two years after excavation began, the oldest subway in the Western Hemisphere opened on September 1st, 1897. Originally, a small section of subway for surface-going streetcars to alleviate traffic in the heavily populated downtown, it ran from the Public Gardens Portal to Boylston Street Station, which did not seem to survive the war, to Park Street Station, and then out to the Pleasant Street Portal, making Park Street the oldest surviving subway station in the wasteland. Looks pretty good for its age, eh, Eddie? 
A year later, the tunnel had been extended to Scully Square, Adams Square, and Haymarket. Within a decade or so, subways were soon spreading all over Boston and the surrounding towns. In 1912, the Cambridge Tunnel opened between Harvard, or College Square, and Park Street, which had been built a new lower platform under the original station, called Park Street Under, creatively enough. The new traffic from transfers between the two lines, which would only worsen over the next few years as the Cambridge Tunnel was extended south to Dorchester, required a major renovation to the upper streetcar level, substantially lengthening them. By the 1940s, increased ownership of automobiles led to a severe drop in ridership, which led to a closing of some lines, and sparked outcry from poorer citizens, and also from city planners concerned about congested traffic, for the government to step in. All the streetcars and subways had previously been operated by private companies, but in 1947, the Metropolitan Transit Authority, or the MTA, was formed. A state-run agency, they bought all the former Metropolitan Rapid Transit, including subways, streetcars, and buses. For ease of wayfinding, in the 1960s the MTA assigned colors to its four rapid transit lines. The original Tremont Street subway and streetcar line becoming the green line, the Cambridge-Dorchester tunnel becoming the red line, the main elevated line that ran from Malden to Roxbury becoming the orange line, and the East Boston and Revere tunnel that ran from Scully Square to the airport in East Boston and on to Revere Beach became the blue line. At some point after this, the light rail streetcars of the green line seemed to have been phased out for the more common subway cars found on the other lines. In the mid-21st century, the MTA started a new monorail system, which shared some stations with the old subway, but traveled an elevated route, suspended from the elevated highways, and opened new stations to service them. Two of these lines were built before the war, one extending from Quincy, through the theater district, into Charlestown, and ending east of Lexington. The other starting in the north, in Reading, passing west of the city and interchanging with the first line near Lexington, and then heading south to Norwood, in what is now the Glowing Sea. The monorail project was eventually supposed to replace the entire aging subway network, but in 2077, amongst growing shortages during the Great War, the MTA was forced to close, and it sold this station, Park Street, to vault where they began construction on Vault 114. And that's where I searched for Solomon an unfinished vault in a subway. It seemed freer of skeletons than most vaults I'd explored. From some terminal entries, it seemed like no one had ever really moved in here, except perhaps the Overseer, a fellow with the unlikely name of Soup Can Harry, apparently a destitute homeless man who was a fan of eating a Braxo cleaner and who believed the government used tax money to fund Illuminati Freemason sex parties. Well, Eddie, I don't know what Illuminati or Freemasons are, but the rest sounds pretty good. Apparently, vault fucked up experiment with this one was to populate the vault with the cream of Boston's high society, and then force them to live in Spartan, cramped quarters, with an incompetent, poor, and anti-authority overseer ruling over them. Actually, that sounds pretty funny, Eddie. Maybe vault wasn't all bad. What this vault lacked in skeletons, however, was made up for in fresher corpses. Men and ghouls dressed like pre-war gangsters. Some weird raider gang? I don't know, Eddie. But I judged by the decay that they had been dead a week, maybe longer. But less than a month. Had Solomon killed them? If so, I was at least a week behind him. Then again, the somewhat controlled environment of a vault even partially finished, probably retards decay a bit, so it's hard to judge. In any case, I turned up no direct evidence of Solomon's presence, 
and so, with my pockets and bags stuffed with fresh scav, I had no choice but to head back here to Diamond City. But first, I decided to stop to consult the guide. Ah, uh, the commons. In all my long years wandering the wastelands, I have never been warned so strongly and so frequently to avoid a place. Worse yet, I couldn't get a straight answer from anyone as to what was so dangerous about the place, and its mysterious and dangerous swan. Against my better judgment, I have decided to actually listen to advice for once. For now. Still, scouting the perimeter of the commons, it's plain to see it would otherwise be a prime piece of real estate. Grass, soil, water, plenty of material for scav, and yet conveniently located near all the amenities of Diamond City, Good Neighbor, and the Combat Zone, and all the other insanity of downtown. The fear of the swan seems to have kept raiders and mutants away, so if someone could clear out the swan, it would be a perfect place to... You know what? Never mind. Gonna keep that to myself. For later. You all should probably just avoid the area. For now. After a few trips to the local merchants, with my pockets now full of caps from selling off the scav, I spent some time at the dugout, spreading caps around, buying rounds of drinks for the locals. It made me popular, both with the locals and with Vadim, the owner and bartender. After he heard me talking about looking for Solomon, he approached me, claiming to have some info on him, though I think he had more lascivious thoughts in mind than a simple information share. He said, Come, you. Meet me in back room. We discuss plan. I'll follow you into the back room, but the only plan I'm going to discuss is the information. What you're thinking of wouldn't happen if you were the last man left in the wasteland. I told him to keep in mind. Haven't met a man I couldn't lay out. So, what did you have in mind? I'm gonna need some more in the way of details. Gonna need some more information. After I got it through to him that what he wanted to happen wasn't going to, he realized it would be best for his health and his pocketbook to tell me what he knew. Turns out that the Nick Solomon had gone off to Park Street looking for was Nick Valentine, the detective who ran the agency here in town and that Nick had also taken up with traveling with Solomon. They had been on the trail of someone named Kellogg, but had apparently found him, and had then headed off to a place called Good Neighbor, a settlement not far from Park Street, around Scully Square. Finally, a fresh lead. So that's where we are now, Eddie. The path forward is clear. I just hope the trail is fresh, and then we aren't tracking his week's old movements anymore. Only time will tell, so I better slam a few drinks so I can pass out soon and get an early start tomorrow. Don't judge me, Eddie. 